Hello everyone. I'm Shalin Kasira from Ashri Rajasthan chapter. I welcome you on behalf of Ashri India chapter and Ashri Rajasthan chapter. Today we have Ashri distinguished lecturer Mr. Daniel Nal for webinar presentation on water conservation and HVAC design. Mr. Nal is a graduate of Princeton University and Cornell University. He is a registered architect, a professional engineer, an Ashri Life Fellow, a fellow of the AIA, a lead fellow, a certified building energy modeling professional, a high performance building design professional, and a certified passive house consultant. Ashray activities include the Ashray Advanced Energy Design Guide Steering Committee, Chair of SPA 227, the Passive Building Standard, the Building Energy Quotient Ad Hoc and Oversight Committee, and TC 4.7. He was one of the contributors to the Engineer's Notebook monthly column in the Ashley Journal. He received the Ashley New York Chapter Distinguished Service Award in 2011 and the Ashley Distinguished Service Award in 2012. Mr. Nal was named one of the 25 newsmakers of 2007 by Engineering News Record magazine. He was named Outstanding Practitioner 2004 by the US Chapter of the International Building Performance Simulation Association. He is the author of over 40 papers in technical and professional journals. He has been a visiting lecturer at the University of Pennsylvania, Cornell University, and Princeton University School of Architecture and an adjunct associate professor of architecture at Columbia. Before handing over to Mr. Nal, I request all the participants to raise the query through question tab. Mr. Nal will take your query after the presentation. Recording of this webinar will be available on YouTube channel of Ashray Raisan chapter. Now I would like to request Mr. Nal to deliver the presentation. Sir, over to you. Thank you very much, Osama. Um, this is my first Ashray DL uh, in digital format. Um, I wish I could be there in person, but then again, the world has changed significantly in the last four months. And so, um, we're going to be doing things, a lot of things remotely uh, going forward, I think. So this morning, um, it's morning my time, uh, afternoon, early evening your time. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, water conservation and building design. Um, this presentation is uh, Certified for Continuing Education by the American Institute of Architects. I doubt that that really applies to anyone in this audience, but then sometimes it does. It's also a, uh, accredited for one hour of general continuing education uh, hours by uh, GBCI for uh, the continuing education requirements for your lead AP. You can um, self-report uh, your attendance to this. The course ID you can see at the bottom 092-000-5383. And if you report with that number, you should get credit for attending this uh, session. Today, we're gonna talk about uh, options for water conservation and wastewater harvesting techniques. Um, the technology for water conservation will be discussed. Utilization of on-site non-potable water resources will be discussed and methods of capturing and treating uh, these resources will be presented. The requirements of water consumption in uses that can benefit from non-potable resources will be presented along with technical issues that limit the exploitation of these, res of these resources. Case studies showing a two-thirds reduction in potable water consumption through utilization of both conservation measures and non-potable water harvesting will be presented. So uh, the learning objectives is to recognize how HVAC systems use water and how they generate non-potable water resources, integrate the different strategies of water conservation for dramatic reductions in consumption, allocate different types of reclaimed water to different uses, different types of non-potable uses, and overcome contamination issues to optimize reuse of harvested wastewater. Our aspirin slides. 
urging you to um, complete the uh, online critique when this uh, presentation is done and to encourage you to volunteer and participate in ASHRAE. <clears throat> Here is an outline of today's presentation. The upcoming water crisis and the natural water cycle, water conservation opportunities in, biz in buildings, non-potable water resources in buildings and end uses that don't require potable water, non-potable water treatment options for buildings, the total dissolved solids issue for treated wastewater and methods of dealing with that issue, a successful case study for dramatic water use reduction. This is the projected uh, global water stress uh, for 2030. Uh, I think um, it says at the top 2040, but the slide is for 2030. I think there is an updated uh, 2040, and I think probably the picture is even more bleak, um, showing a great segment of the world uh, with um, severe water stress and some areas of the world uh, where the water stress is so severe uh, that it has a negative impact on the economy. If we look at uh, per capita water uh, consumption, uh, we can see that uh, India is actually doing quite well um, compared certainly with uh, uh, United Arab Emirates, uh, Canada and the United States. So perhaps you're already uh, uh, making use of, of many of the measures that are going to be um, proposed in this uh, in this uh, presentation. If we look at the natural water cycle, uh, we can see that the vast preponderance of water on the face of the earth is in water storage in the oceans. However, the total dissolved solid content of the water in the ocean make it really unusable for most human applications. We certainly can't drink it. Um, washing with it, well, not so much. We could, we, if we had salt water available uh, in our homes, we could flush our toilets with it. On the other hand, uh, this, this salinity content would likely disrupt the functionality of our traditional wastewater treatment plants. So maybe that wouldn't work either. The issue is that uh, the that <clears throat> clean, fresh water is available in liquid form in only a very small portion of this entire water cycle. Most of the water is in saline, storage in the ocean or as water vapor in the atmosphere. It's only after it condenses from the atmosphere and falls on the surface that it becomes useful. Unfortunately, our way of our means of handling water falling from the skies is uh, traditionally to capture it, put it in a pipe, rush it to the nearest river, where it uh, rapidly flows to the ocean where it's no longer usable. So we don't really, um, in most places, do we, we, we do not really try to integrate human use into the natural water cycle. So when we look at water conservation in buildings, there's a number of standard strategies, and here's a list. We can uh, basically want to reduce our primary uh, potable consumption using uh, low flow fixtures, water sense appliances. Um, we want to identify our non-potable uh, end uses, things like flushing, irrigation, cooling tower makeup, exterior housekeeping, that's washing off the sidewalk or washing your car or something like that. Uh, we want to look at the ability to harvest non-potable resources HVAC, condensate, uh, stormwater, roof runoff, a cooling tower, blowdown, uh, surplus groundwater. Each of these had different levels of contamination and, and different suitability for, for, for specific 
end users. So our residential low flow plumbing, plumbing fixtures, excuse me, um, there are a lot of them on the market. Um, we can uh, um, specify uh, low flush rate water closets. We can uh, specify low flow rate lavatory faucets, low flow rate uh, shower heads. Um, uh, we can specify low flow rate kitchen faucets. Oops. <laughs> we can also utilize uh, cooling tower blowdown control. And I'm not going to go into these, all of these uh, um, uh, calculations here, but uh, you can look them up or you can take a screenshot of this and, and use it yourself. But uh, basically what we're saying here is that uh, typically cooling power blowdown is controlled or not controlled, perhaps at a constant rate. It just happens or, or you have periodically a valve that opens and, and, and drains the basin or something of that nature. Um, what we're saying here is that we can, we can control the blowdown rate based upon maintaining a constant level of total dissolved solids in the base, basin. And typically um, that, uh, um, that level of total dissolved solids is on the, uh, in the range of somewhere between 1500 to 2000 parts per million. And this is based upon uh, uh, avoiding um, the uh, uh, development of uh, scale, um, et cetera, or excessive um, corrosion uh, within the cooling plant. Um, by doing so, by, by continuously controlling cooling power blowdown, uh, we can say a lot, a lot of uh, water uh, compared with uh, uh, more conventional non-controlled uh, blowdown. <clears throat> we can also, with respect to uh, irrigation, uh, control um, how much irrigation we do, and we can also convey it to the ground in a way that's much more efficient. So basically, um, uh, underground tr trickle uh, irrigation is much more efficient because the overhead spray type irrigation loses anywhere from 25 to 40 percent of the water uh, in the form of evaporation. That's of course depending upon exactly how uh, arid is uh, your your climate. How what how low is the relative humidity of the of the air? Uh, in places that need a lot of irrigation, uh, likely the relative humidity of the air is very low and your irrigation losses via evaporation are quite high. So what's proposed here is that you, uh, you control irrigation uh, based upon a measurement of the moisture content of the soil. Uh, you irrigate only when the soil is dry and furthermore, you deliver the irrigation to the ground through underground trickle generation rather than overhead spray. <clears throat> different types of buildings have different levels of water consumption and that water consumption uh, goes to different end uses. So if we look at an office building compared with a, a laboratory, we can see that in the office building, uh, the preponderance of, uh, of water consumption is uh, for sanitary uh, disposal, basically flushing toilets and urinals. Um, the rest of it is for uh, uh, different types of, uh, or for irrigation or cooling tower makeup or, or kitchen use or th things of that nature. Um, 73% of that water consumption in that building does not require potable water. 
So under sanitary, I think we might also be including uh, water usage in hand wash sinks. So that's uh, both uh, toilet flushing and hand wash sinks. <coughs> Of the 73% non-potable, however, uh, it, it, uh, um, it appears that 60% of that non-potable usage is for uh, flushing. Uh, we look at the laboratory water consumption and we have 58% non-potable. The preponderance of that is cooling tower makeup and then there is, um, uh, under the potable side, we have uh, the laboratory processes and things of that nature. If we're looking at uh, uh, utilizing our non-potable water re uh, assets, we can evaluate them with respect to what kinds of contamination they might have. And we can compare these with uh, the water that comes in from the city. Now, arguably, in some cases, water that comes in from the city is not healthy. Um, we have our example in our country of Flint, Michigan, where there were high levels of lead salts in the in the city water supply, causing a lot of uh, uh, health issues, primarily for children. One thing I need to point out at this at this time is that potable the the word potable as a descriptor of water is not a chemical definition; it is a legal definition. <clears throat> Potable water is water that has been certified by an authority designated with that responsibility and duty by law that um, the water is safe for human consumption. So clearly Flint, Michigan had potable water, but it was not safe for human consumption because the authority having jurisdiction for the um, monitoring and correction of that water supply failed. So when we talk about potable water, we talk about water that someone has, some authority has taken the responsibility to verify that it is safe. So we take water like HVAC condensate, which is likely particularly if you're using uh, UVC irradiation of your cooling coils, um, HVAC condensate likely has fewer impurities than does your city water, but it is not potable unless someone is continuously monitoring it, testing it, and certifying it that its level of purity and its safety for human consumption. So HVAC condensate, while very pure, essentially, you know, it's distilled water, um, is, um, is not potable. Storm water from the roof, not potable, and so on and so forth. And here are the various uh, categories, and here are the levels of, of uh, contamination in each of these categories of non-potable water. Some of the black water sewage has got high levels of all kinds of, uh, of, uh, of contaminants and is not really suitable for use for anything except possibly for thermal <coughs> harvesting, either extraction of heat or, um, or rejection of heat from HVAC systems we are beginning to see some projects in the U.S. where we are um, doing thermal harvesting of sewage lines. Um, <coughs> we often hear the term gray water. Uh, that, uh, that term is uh, not well defined. There are different types of gray water, typically storm water off the roof, and wash water, uh, which is uh, water reclaimed from hand wash sinks, uh, perhaps uh, showers, bathtubs, uh, dishwashers, that sort of thing, clothes washers, wash water. Uh, both wash water and storm water are often classified as gray water, but you can see that they have 
uh, different uh, levels of different types of contamination. Uh, specifically, wash water often has a much higher concentration of dissolved organic content than does stormwater. And that has implications, particularly if you're going to store this water for later use. It's typically safer to store stormwater for later use uh, because it has low level of dissolved organics, perhaps sufficiently low uh, that uh, they can be uh, consumed uh, by bacteria using the dissolved oxygen that's in the water and thus the stormwater does not become fetid. Whereas wash water, the level of dissolved organics is sufficiently high that uh, if it's stored, the aerobic bacteria will consume the uh, some level of the dissolved organic content until such point as the dissolved oxygen in the water is depleted, at which point the anaerobic bacteria take over and the wash water begins to stink because one of the characteristics of anaerobic bacteria is that they excrete uh, some um, organic uh, compounds, gases that, uh, that human nose can quite readily detect. And uh, so uh, uh, very different characteristics in terms of how you handle that water. So if we look at matching our sources and end uses, city water, we can drink it, we can use it to wash our face, our hands, our bodies. HVAC condensate, we can use it to flush toilets. We can also use it for domestic hygiene. We could wash um, <coughs> clothes in it. Uh, potentially, if we use a, a, a germicide detergent, we could wash our dishes in it. And a lot of people, uh, particularly women, like to wash their hair uh, in distilled water because it, uh, it uh, results in less soap film uh, clinging to their hair. Uh, similarly, uh, a stormwater, good for flushing, good for cooling tower makeup. Stormwater on grade typically has more organic content and more particulate, suspended particulate matter uh, than does stormwater off the roof. And therefore, uh, I wouldn't want to put stormwater from the grade into my cooling tower because I'd wind up with, uh, with sludge issues uh, ultimately, but uh, certainly can store it on site and in ponds and various kinds of open uh, water features and then use it for irrigation of the rest of the land uh, when we have a dry period. Wash water can be used directly for irrigation if you do not store it and if you use underground trickle irrigation. Uh, the California Department of Public Health, which has been uh, very active in, in, in reviewing this technology, specifies that there has to be a certain distance of dirt, like one inch or something between possible human contact and the delivery of this water. So you can't use wash water directly um, for, uh, let's say, flushing because it is uh, adjacent to a human occupancy. And when you flush the toilet, it typically creates a, a, a plume of, of, of aerosols and droplets that come up into the air. And it's quite possible that your wash water uh, might, uh, um, might have been stored and might have grown uh, some uh, bacteria that might be uh, injurious to human health. However, if you treat the wash water with uh, a biocide, chlorine or ozonation and that sort of thing, uh, it's possible uh, to use the wash water for flushing. Um, however, having said that, uh, you know, you still have the issue of, of, of when you uh, apply the biocide and whether or not in the process of storing, you're going to grow something. Cooling tower blowdown. The problem with cooling tower blowdown is that it's got a relatively high level of total dissolved solids. Remember, we're controlling our cooling tower to maintain uh, 1,500 to 2,000 parts per million uh, for um, 
uh, level of dissolved solids, whereas typically your city water is going to have somewhere between 50 and in the case if you've got very hard water as much as 200 parts per million. So um, this water has a, a very high level of, of total dissolved solids. It you could not drink it, uh, it would be uh, unhealthy. It will likely kill your plants if you try to irrigate directly with it. However, it's possible to treat this cooling tower blowdown with reverse osmosis. And uh, I'll get into that uh, in more detail in a minute, but it turns out that when you have a very slightly brackish water source, such as cooling tower blowdown, and in some cases, some wells, um, the energy content, the amount of energy required uh, to create clean water using reverse osmosis is really quite low because the pressure differential across the semi-permeable membrane in the reverse osmosis device is uh, that required pressure to push clean water across the membrane is dependent upon the the total dissolved solid uh, uh, level in the source water and if it's quite low that energy requirement is quite low then we have treated black water so we have to treat the black water filter it let let it settle to get the solids out of it and then treat it typically uh, biologically with bacteria uh, to remove all of the organic uh, uh, solids uh, or, or organic both suspended particulates and and dissolved organics uh, to to use bacteria to convert those to carbon dioxide and water and occasionally some some salts such as nitrates <coughs> or sulfates small amounts uh, once uh, it's, uh, this black water is treated, depending upon the, total, the content of total dissolved solids in the treated black water, we could use that for cooling tower make, uh, makeup or irrigation. So we have our criteria uh, for uh, using non-potable water. So there are uh, several different measures of the level of contamination of uh, non-potable water. One of these is what's called the biological oxygen demand, BOD. What that says is um, how much we presume that we have aerobic bacteria uh, that, are go that would consume the, um, the organic content of this uh, water, of these contaminants, uh, organic contaminants. Um, our bacteria will consume them. The question is how much oxygen is required by those bacteria uh, to remove all of the organic contaminants from the water sample? So that uh, biological uh, oxygen demand, uh, milligrams per liter of oxygen required to remove the contaminants, uh, is a, a common measure of how much organic contamination exists. And you can see that if we're going to irrigate ornamental uh, um, plants or fruit trees or fodder crops, so we're not talking about um, uh, we're not talking about potatoes or carrots or 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 crops that uh, have uh, or leafy crops such as spinach or things like that or celery. Uh, that you eat directly, but we're talking about fruit trees where the irrigation occurs remotely from the consumable part of the, the crop or fodder crops that are fed to animals or ornamental uh, plants, which you don't eat, then the BOD is, is, uh, has to be less than or equal to 240 milligrams per liter. We have irrigation of, of vegetables likely to be eaten uncooked it has to be less than 20. And if we're going to be flushing toilets, it has to be uh, less than 10. Th these are the requirements for how often uh, the sample must be taken to verify that uh, this level of purity. Uh, we have the total dissolved solids, or excuse me, total suspended solids. And these are uh, a measure of uh, 
just how cloudy is the water. And this is in milligrams per liter. And you can see um, different levels for the different uh, non-potable end uses. And then we have fecal coliform. This is obviously the, uh, the bacteria that comes from human uh, elimination of solid waste. Uh, it's a measure typically of all we can uh, evidently a fecal coliform bacteria are very easy to detect. And basically uh, by measuring that count, it's taken as a surrogate for the overall uh, bacteriological uh, contamination of the water sample. So they basically uh, uh, count the, the uh, uh, fecal coliform uh, in the uh, sample and then uh, it uh, it indicates exactly how much uh, total bacteriological sample or bacteriological contamination there is in the sample, and that, that's the that's the frequency of uh, of um, of the testing. <clears throat> if we look at the characteristics of gray water, that is of wash water, in this circumstance. The total BOD typically is somewhere between 90 and 290. Total suspended solids of 45 to 330. The turbidity uh, is uh, of this amount. The fecal coliform may be uh, quite high, and this is the level of our pH. So uh, basically, uh, what this indicates is that wash water for you to be used uh, for um, for flushing likely has to go through some treatment. The treatment typically can consist of filtration, chlorination to kill the, uh, the fecal coliform or to kill bacteria. But prior to the chlorination, what you may want to do is to have a treatment tank wherein you, uh, you aerate the water. Basically, you bubble air through the water um, that will uh, enable uh, or provide sufficient oxygen that your standard aerobic bacteria uh, can remove uh, much of the organic content. Um, and then, uh, so basically, first thing you do, you filter the water. Next thing you do, you aerate it, you let it sit, and then you chlorinate or ozonate it before it's delivered. Uh, to be used for toilet flushing. <clears throat> we can harvest gray water directly uh, for um, trickle irrigation. And in this case, we have a surge tank. You can see that the intent of the surge tank is not to store the water. It just recognizes the fact that the water incoming uh, gray water does not come in a steady stream. Rather, it comes, you know, uh, in the morning when people walk, flush showers and may come, there may be a lot of, or when people are taking showers, may come in a big rush. And so basically your submerged pump wants to deliver water uh, to the irrigation system at a constant rate. So the surge tank merely uh, smooths out the surges in supply so that, uh, or, or the surges in intake to the system so that the provision of irrigation uh, to uh, the soil uh, can be uh, uh, more constant. So we have using gray water, we have uh, uh, preliminary uh, uh, removal of particulates uh, and uh, uh, and grit particles by screening or settling. And then we can use that for trickle or subsurface irrigation. We remove the suspended solid by screening set sedimentation out. Uh, then we might be able to use it for surface irrigation of ornamental plants. Biological treatment and removal of common biodegradable organic pollutants. Essentially that what that means is either uh, an activated sludge or just uh, an aerobic treatment, uh, and then we can use it for cooling tower makeup. Uh, and then uh, if we, um, we want to use it for uh, flushing, uh, we 
need to remove uh, certain uh, specific pollutants, nitrogen, phosphorus, color, odor, et cetera. And these are the, the various uh, um, uh, technologies that are available for this level of treatment to be able to use it for flushing, depending upon the level of contamination that is in the gray water. So for example, uh, water from uh, uh, clothes washing uh, is, has a relatively low level of, uh, of uh, organic contamination compared with, let's say, a, a shower where people are using soaps and, uh, and shampoos and, and body wash and, uh, and hair uh, conditioner and all that kind of stuff. So you get a relatively high level of organic uh, content uh, from a shower, uh, whereas with a, uh, um, whereas with clothes washing, you have both a wash cycle and a rinse cycle and the level of, uh, of, uh, of soap uh, uh, detergent is uh, is relatively low. <clears throat> Here are our criteria for interior usage of recycled water. And this is from ANSI NSF standard 350. Uh, so uh, we have here these various uh, uh, criteria. And so what we're saying is that um, it's that if we're going to use non-potable water for, and this is when we say interior usage, we are talking about usage uh, adjacent to human occupancy. And so typically what that would mean is uh, flushing of toilets. <clears throat> These criteria would not apply, for example, to subsurface uh, trickle irrigation. So here we have how we might use uh, rainwater harvesting for interior use. Uh, we catch our uh, roof drain with a, our detention weir. Uh, we basically take it to a primary filter, which typically might be a centrifugal separator. We have our storage tank. Uh, we have our... Um, uh, and in the storage tank, we may... Uh, in fact, put a, uh, uh, an aeration uh, uh, pump that would pump water, uh, excuse me, would pump air, uh, bubble it through the water to enhance the, uh, um, the biological uh, reduction of, uh, of any organic content that might be in the water. Think about what kind of organic uh, content we're going to have in this stormwater are two things. Primarily, uh, one would be uh, uh, what I call tree trash, you know, leaves and things like that, uh, that, uh, that manage to make their way up onto the roof. And the second thing is bird droppings. Uh, <clears throat> typically those would be the only uh, organic contaminants. Uh, most of the, uh, the, the tree trash uh, is going to be in the form of, uh, particulates of a, a, of a larger size, and most, if not all of those, will be removed by your primary filter. Um, the uh, uh, little bit of, uh, of, uh, of bird droppings, one strategy for dealing with that is what they call a, a first flush valve. And so what happens there is that the when it begins to rain, the first tranche of water that comes off the roof is delivered to the drain. And it's only after the water has been running for a period of time that you actually capture it. And the presumption there is that the initial sort of uh, a flood of, uh, of water off the roof will bring with it um, all of the bird droppings or, or most of them so that the water that comes later uh, will be more pure. So then we have our, we have our main storage tank and then we have our, our uh, secondary uh, uh, tank uh, where we do the treatment and uh, you can see that right here. So it's at this point where we do our uh, uh, chlorination or ozonation. We might do UV irradiation. And in some, in some uh, jurisdictions, we have to add dye to the water so that it has a, 
a color so that it's uh, people can know immediately that it is not codable. Uh, here we have uh, a cartoon for HVAC condensate for uh, uh, interior use. So in this circumstance, we have our cooling coil, we have our condensate pan, uh, we have our UVC lamps for antimicrobial. Uh, we basically dump that into a, a, a storage tank and then uh, we can use the lift pump uh, with demand control uh, um, to, uh, to, pro to, to serve our toilets. Because there is no organic content in this air typically, because, or excuse me, in this water typically, because you filtered the air coming into the coil and you've killed any bacteria that might be trying to grow or fungus with UVC lamps, um, the likelihood that this water will not comply with the standards I showed previously uh, for uh, uh, interior use of uh, of uh, of uh, non-potable water this water almost certainly will comply with those standards with no treatment one of the strategies that uh, uh, has been growing around the world is what we call uh, decentralized wastewater uh, treatment so the typical model uh, of, of wastewater treatment in large cities is a very centralized system uh, where you collect su um, wastewater, sewage water from all over and then deliver it to a, uh, 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 a large wastewater treatment plant where it's discharged, the effluent, the treated sewage effluent is discharged to um, a river or something like that. Typically, these wastewater treatment plants will be located outside of the city area. <clears throat> um, an emerging technology, particularly in developing uh, in cities and in, in, in developing nations, is decentralized wastewater uh, collection and treatment, wherein um, the the treatment, uh, the collection is very local, the treatment is in very, very small plants, and then the treated sewage effluent is available uh, for non-potable end uses. And here's what this looks like, uh, a DWATS, Decentralized Wastewater Treatment System. So we have our sewer come in and we have a settling uh, tank where the sludge forms uh, and then there's a scum and then the water from the middle cleaner uh, flows into uh, a, a further settling tank and then it goes through a, a, a series of, um, of, um, of aerobic treatments. Uh, and then finally uh, goes through uh, the several other chambers until it outflows into a, uh, a constructed uh, wetland. This kind of plant can actually be built into a street and you can collect the sewage from all the residences or buildings on that street and then do this under the street with appropriate manhole uh, access and here's uh, uh, basically this is uh, a um, uh, the constructed wetlands that is the final finishing step uh, to purify uh, the uh, uh, sewage water into water that could be used for uh, further irrigation or or cooling tower makeup or with appropriate uh, uh, antimicrobial treatments such as chlorination could be used for flushing toilets. <clears throat> so what we're looking for is what I call an improved urban water cycle where we we sort of uh, we, we integrate uh, human activity uh, into the natural water cycle with the idea that there is no waste disposal into our surface water bodies whether those be lakes or rivers that we <coughs> treat our waste in the process and we reuse um, water uh, as uh, available uh, for the various uh, non-potable end uses 
that we have. And arguably over the entire sort of, uh, uh, let's say over an entire city, much more than half of the water used in the city does not need to be potable. It has to have various levels of uh, contamination control ranging from uh, uh, a lot, significant uh, re removal of uh, contamination to not so much. So things like underground trickle gener uh, irrigation uh, does, requires much less uh, treatment than let's say flushing toilets. <clears throat> so when we talk about uh, recycling treated sewage effluent, uh, basically, here we have uh, 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 our sewage water, and here we have our treated sewage water. And this is a this is a large, typical sort of uh, uh, sewage treatment plant. Um, the problem, however, is is that typical sewage treatment plants um, do not deal with dissolved solids. Dissolved solids are inorganic salts of various kinds. Uh, so standard treatment plants utilize bacteria basically to get rid of all the organic contaminants, but they don't do anything typically about the inorganic contaminants. So this is a uh, this is a sort of a uh, uh, a little uh, spreadsheet I did for ion and water mass balance for building sewage effluent. So this is an office building and we have some water closets, some urinals, some lavatories, and this is the usage rate over the course of the day and all this kind of stuff. <clears throat> One of the things that we know is that the ion excretion average per person, and ion excretion uh, basically uh, is talking about salts of various kinds. So it may be standard table salt, which is, uh, you know, sodium chloride. It, a, a major component of human salt excretion is, uh, our, our, is bicarbonate. Uh, so we have calcium uh, bicarbonate and sodium bicarbonate uh, also includes some, uh, uh, a little bit of sulfates, uh, uh, some um, uh, carbonates, various things uh, coming from human beings, depending upon what they eat. But this is 72.8 grams per day. So we go, uh, if we say in this office building that each person uh, loses of the total uh, ion excretion per day, they 33% uh, they is uh, deposited in this uh, office building where they're working for eight hours. And so that means that uh, uh, the, in the building, each person is putting out 24 grams and the sewage flow is this. What that means is that the, if we have, is that the effluent total dissolved solids rise in the wastewater coming out of this building is 588, uh, 589 milligrams per liter. That is 589 parts per million. So if the uh, water coming into this building, let's say it's hard water, and it's coming in at 200 parts per million, it's leaving at 789 uh, parts per million total dissolved solids. And one of the things that we can know is that um, that's not good for makeup water for your cooling tower, because basically um, your blowdown your concentration um, uh, ratio for your cooling tower, if you're putting in 789 uh, parts per million and you're trying to maintain, let's just make it easy, 1,550 parts per million, your blowdown rate is going to be half your makeup water rate. So you're going to be throwing away half the makeup water that you put away in that cooling tower, and only half of it will be used for evaporation. Also, 789 parts per million are probably going to kill most of the plants that you would use to irrigate it. So this is an issue. So uh, one of the ways of dealing with this issue is to use water appropriately uh, 
for uh, different end uses. So what we can do is that we can um, uh, we can use the treated sewage effluent uh, for uh, toilet flushing, uh, and basically we can use the uh, recovered rainwater from the roof and the HVAC condensate, which have very low total dissolved solids. We can use that for make up for our cooling tower. Uh, our cooling tower effluent in this case, we're going to throw it away and then we're going to lose a significant portion of our, uh, of, of, of our um, wastewater from our hand wash sinks and from our, uh, and, and from our water closets to the sewer outflow. If we add a reverse uh, osmosis treatment uh, to this uh, to this scenario, we have potable water coming in from the city. It's used for our hand wash sinks, and and uh, then it uh, goes to our uh, packaged sewage treatment plant, uh, and then uh, that uh, uh, high uh, total of solids. Uh, Water storage uh, used to flush and for for our hand wash sinks, and then we we can take some we can use our reverse osmosis plant to remove total dissolved solids uh, from the uh, from the uh, 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 from the treated sewage effluent, and then we can use that in combination with our recovered rainwater in combination with our uh, air conditioning effluent uh, condensate. Uh, to uh, for our cooling tower makeup. <clears throat> now, in the United States and in some areas of the world, um, some localities, some cities have a real problem uh, with the uh, total dissolved solids that are going into uh, their sewage treatment plants. This is particularly a problem in Arizona, in the southwest of the United States, likely in other areas of the world, where the water is uh, fairly hard, 150 to 200 parts per million. <coughs> and um, most of the electrical generation is either in the form of uh, coal or of steam power plants whether they be uh, coal fired or, uh, or fuel oil fired or even uranium, they still require huge cooling towers uh, to condense the steam back into the liquid to go through the steam cycle uh, to, to drive the turbines to make the electricity. And as a result, there are huge amounts of, uh, of uh, had been huge amounts of cooling tower blowdown uh, flowing into the local sewer system. So remember, we're controlling our cooling towers to have um, a, uh, a total dissolved solids level of 1,500 to 2,000 parts per million. So when you've got a multi megawatt power plant, that's a huge amount of blowdown flowing into the local sewer system. And with that huge amount of total dissolved solids, what happens is that the discharge from the sewage treatment plant has a very high total dissolved solids because the sewage treatment plant does nothing to remove them. They discharge that into the river and it kills the fish. It kills the uh, aquatic uh, um, uh, plants. And so basically you get a dead zone uh, in your river you know, immediately downstream of where you're discharging from your sewage treatment plant. So a number of, of um, localities have issued, have enacted what they call net zero liquid discharge from cooling towers. So basically they're telling the, the uh, factory that has a big cooling tower, or they're telling the, um, the, the power plant, you can't put your blowdown into uh, my uh, sewage treatment plant. <clears throat> so what do these uh, what 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 are these uh, uh, facilities to do? 
So what has happened is that there's developed uh, uh, some recent, uh, relatively last 10 years, technology for cooling tower treatment that really enhances the concentration ratio that you can achieve in the cooling tower by allowing very, very, very high total dissolved solids in the cooling tower water. So basically what happens is this. And the first thing that happens is that the makeup water is softened. So basically what happens in this chemistry is that um, all of the magnesium and calcium ions are removed and sodium ions are substituted. And the reason for that is because sodium salts, sodium carbonate, sodium chloride, uh, sodium bicarbonate, sodium uh, um, sulfate are, are all much, much more soluble than are the calcium and the magnesium salt. So you can have a much, much, much higher concentration ratio or uh, total dissolved solid uh, parts per million of sodium salts than you can with calcium and magnesium salts before you start developing scale. So the second strategy is to control the pH of the, uh, of the water uh, in the cooling tower to in the range of nine to 10, which is very basic. And what this does is this uh, typically causes the ammonium ions uh, to develop into ammonia gas where it will be, uh, it, it, it will be off gassed from the water. The reason you're worried about that is because ammonium ions will attack any copper, solid copper in the system. So if you have any copper or brass fittings, ammonium ions will attack that. But if you get rid of the ammonia by off-gassing, if you get rid of the ammonium ions by off-gassing ammonia, then in fact, you'll uh, not have that problem. And then the third major step is to control the silicate concentration of the water. So you want the silicate um, concentration in the water to be such that um, you form a very thin um, scale of silica on all the metallic surfaces to protect them from corrosion. And a number of facilities have successfully implemented this rather complex uh, cooling tower water treatment uh, regime and they are able to achieve concentration ratios in their cooling tower of as much uh, as 750 to 1000 to 1 and they are running they are running total dissolved solids uh, uh, ratios in their cooling tower water of 100 to 150,000 parts per million. So basically the total mass content of their cooling tower water is somewhere between uh, seven and 10% dissolved solids. These dissolved solids remain uh, dissolved because they are sodium salts and uh, you controlling the scaling, you're controlling the corrosion, obviously, in cooling tower water that is 100,000 parts per million, you don't have to worry about any kind of, uh, of antibacteriological or biocidal treatment because nothing will grow in that water at all, ever. So don't have to worry about Legionella in that water, that's for sure. So when you do this, what happens is that the you do still have a very small amount of blowdown, but you get rid of it by putting it into evaporation pond and then harvesting the, uh, the, uh, um, the, the uh, salts uh, uh, after the water evaporates. And when you uh, go through that, you wind up with a system uh, like this, uh, where the, uh, the, the cooling tower makeup requirement uh, is uh, reduced and there is 
uh, no recovery of blowdown, no e uh, rejection of blowdown into the sewer. Uh, it's all the coiling tower blowdown is going into an evaporation pond. Clearly, this water, you don't want to take it through your chiller. So basically, there is a heat exchanger uh, which is, separates this highly uh, contaminated uh, water, uh, contaminated with, with mineral salts. Uh, from the water that circulates through your, your chillers or other uh, devices. So here uh, basically are the potential uh, water savings in terms of liters per year. Uh, uh, and we can see with the different base case with no recovery, uh, this case with sewage effluent uh, flushing only. Uh, here we have sewage effluent flushing uh, uh, and, and recovery of the cooling tower blowdown. And then here we have the cooling tower with the net, uh, with the zero liquid discharge. The case study is a, is a building in your uh, country in Mumbai, uh, the Godridge headquarters. I worked on that project. I was the lead mechanical engineer up through design development, at which point we turned it over to uh, the uh, uh, local um, uh, uh, office of our international firm, and some changes were made, and and uh, which were I there, I might not have agreed with, but they happened, and uh, so the performance is less than uh, than than we uh, planned for, but I can present that to you. So, in the design phase, the um, the water efficiency measures were the potable water use was uh, uh, limited to ingestion, personal hygiene, and food services. Everything else was going to be non-potable. So we had non-potable resource reclamation. HVAC condensate was centrally collected because we were to use a dedicated outdoor air system, and all the uh, humidity control would be uh, performed by the out door air mass flow, and so we could get all the HVAC condensate there. We were going to have a 1 million gallon uh, stormwater storage tank. We were going to collect uh, water from, the, uh, from uh, the foundation drain. So basically, uh, this building is located about half a kilometer or some, some distance close to the mangrove swamp. Um, the water table is less than half a meter below the surface. We have an 11 meter deep basement. Uh, I asked the geotech engineer if it made sense to have uh, foundation drains. He said, yeah, you could put them in, they're not expensive, but they're not gonna do much uh, to reduce the hydrostatic pressure on the foundations because the water, because the ground is so porous. I said, but we could put them in anyway and it wouldn't uh, cost very much, they're just, PVC pipes that are that are that that are perforated, and he said that's correct. Uh, and I said they wouldn't that wouldn't qualify as a well either, would it? Because uh, local uh, authorities said they were not allowed to have any wells on the site. He said no, it's not a well. So we were going to collect that water. The problem with that water was that it was about 1,200 parts per million uh, total dissolved solids because of the fact that it was so close to the mangrove swamp. The groundwater was brackish. Uh, but you know this is good. Uh, this is good stuff for our uh, reverse osmosis system. And then we were going to have our reclaimed uh, water treatment. The storm water would be filtered and chlorinated. The tertiary uh, black water treatment with the membrane bioreactor system. We'd have cooling tower blowdown and groundwater treated with reverse osmosis to remove the the uh, dissolved solids. This latter measure was removed from the final design after I left the project. So here we have our membrane bioreactor treatment for the black water. Here we have our package reverse osmosis system. I was really proud of the fact I found a, you could buy these packaged, uh, 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 a package that uh, has uh, 14,000 gallon per day input uh, and 11,000 gallons per day output. Uh, you could buy that on a skid. Uh, for $50,000, which was a great uh, uh, value. The energy content of this, uh, uh, of this water, it, it's basically less than one kilowatt hour per cubic meter of uh, water input. And when you look into that, that is 
approximately equal to the um, pumping energy that is put into your city water to get it to your site. So this is not a huge uh, additional energy cost. Uh, if you're doing um, if you're doing uh, RO treatment of uh, of, of seawater, which instead of 1,500 parts per million has about 35,000 parts per million, you'll find that the energy content of, of desalinated uh, uh, seawater with reverse osmosis, the energy content is anywhere from three to four times this amount. And here's uh, the, the flow diagram for you know, this, uh, this system that we designed into the uh, Godridge headquarters. Um, as I mentioned, uh, some of it wasn't implemented, specifically the reverse osmosis. Um, our, we have here our, um, our design uh, usage was to be about 359,000 liters per day. And uh, of that, 124,000 was going to be potable from the city, and all of the rest was going to be recovered uh, from the uh, treatment of the various non-potable sources on site. Uh, basically, uh, as built, with no uh, reverse osmosis treatment and with some downsizing of the rainwater harvesting tanks, uh, we wound up with uh, about 200,000 liters per day potable from the city and about 135,000 uh, total um, uh, supplied from uh, our recovery uh, from our various non-potable on-site resources. So this is stuff about when I did that I did when I was uh, with uh, WSP Flack and Kurtz, uh, and um, the architect was uh, uh, Pelly Clark Pelly. MEP Engineering was WSP Flack and Kurtz New York, as it was known at that time, and uh, I believe uh, the, uh, the, uh, the the engineering and construction docu documents. Um, and um, and construction administration was by WSB India for a while, and then another firm subsequent to that. And that's my presentation. And do you have any questions? Oh, yeah. Thanks, Mr. Null. Uh, we can have a few questions. Uh, first one is, is it possible to replace cooling towers with closed heat exchangers? With closed heat rejection? Um, yes and no. Uh, here's the issue. Um, and I've been working with this issue with the School Construction Authority of New York. Basically, if you have air-cooled chillers, there is some amount of, uh, of um, additional energy uh, for the production of chill water that's entailed. Your best air-cooled chillers work at about 1.0 to 1.05 kW per ton. Your best, um, your best water-cooled chillers with a cooling tower work at maybe 0.68 to 0.7 kW per ton, um, including the condenser water pump and the fans for the cooling tower. So um, the answer is yes, you can do that. Um, and arguably, depending upon the, the water content of uh, the um, the energy content of the water, you could potentially make a case that the air cool chillers were an overall more energy efficient. Unfortunately, that uh, energy content of the water is, is not something that measured directly as energy at the site, but you know it's, a, it's an argument that is legitimate and could be made. One thing I would not recommend at all is using water cooled uh, chillers with um, closed circuit uh, dry uh, fluid coolers. Um, 
this is, I just finished doing a, a, a lengthy peer review of a project that proposed using these and not a good idea. Uh, the, uh, the total energy um, uh, content of that um, technology is typically on the order of 0.2 to 0.3 kW per ton greater than the uh, energy content or energy use of an air-cooled chiller where you are rejecting heat from the refrigerant directly to the air. So if you add the additional um, layers of heat exchange, so refrigerant to water and then water to air, and then you add the uh, condenser water pump, and then you add uh, even greater uh, uh, fan power uh, for the um, closed circuit fluid cooler as compared with the um, air cooled chiller, then in fact, uh, that closed circuit fluid cooler with a liquid, with a water cooled chiller is not a good idea. Any the next question is, yeah, are any filters or methods available to harvest carbon contents from black water and convert this into energy? So yeah, um, some of the uh, some of the wastewater treatment uh, technologies generate methane, and methane is energy and can be used for various uses within the building. So absolutely, that's the case. Uh, that's clearly becomes somewhat more difficult if you've got a, a DWATS, a distributed wastewater treatment. But if you've got a big, if you've got a, 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 a if your DWATS is serving, let's say, uh, a, a multi-building campus, you know, you absolutely uh, could configure your uh, sewage treatment uh, to recover methane and use that as a, you know, fuel for you know, a, a turbine or something of that nature. And that is often done in sewage treatment plants in the United States, where they uh, ha uh, recover methane from the sewage treatment process and run a number of microturbines. Uh, microturbines are, are generally somewhat more, uh, they're so, somewhat more tolerant of, uh, of uh, differing qualities of the incoming fuel uh, gas than our, let's say, um, reciprocating engine, uh, gas-fired engines. So for a country like India, <clears throat> where we generate a lot of uh, sewage and we have a lot of municipal solid waste in a sewage, do you think it will economically make sense? Because India has a large chunk of these uh, sewage treatment, uh, the, 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 the sewer water, which is all getting let into the you know into the rivers and things like that and be discharging all it into uh, and you know polluting the atmosphere so will it make commercial sense uh, you know has some study been done which shows that commercially it is good to get methane out and then this can be used as energy the payback period etc some case studies which are available i'm not aware off the top of my head of any case studies i would advise you to try google search i'm sure you can find them but i will say this uh, I, I did do some consulting uh, for um, uh, San, San Jose, capital of Costa Rica. They have a terrible problem in Costa Rica in that capital city, which is that they have no sewer collection infrastructure whatsoever. Basically, you go to a residential street in that city, and there will be trenches on the side of the road and basically all of the sanitary and stormwater waste from each building on each side of the road discharges directly into these ditches on either side of the road. So you have raw sewage running through ditches on the side of the road. A few years ago, they decided to upgrade their system and what they decided to do was to pave the ditches, which was the worst thing they, they could possibly do, because at least in the ditches, uh, some of the water 
have the opportunity to percolate into through the soil and into the ground and go through the natural cleansing process of filtering as the water made its way down to the ground, potentially to refresh the aquifer. When they and furthermore, there were plants growing in the dishes, and those plants fed off of and utilized some of the organic content of the wastewater for food for fertilizer and remove some of it. The problem is, is that they could not afford the capital expenditure of piping the entire city at one time. And you wouldn't get any benefit if you used a centralized wastewater treatment concept. You wouldn't get any benefit from it until you piped the whole city and then built your wastewater treatment plant and then started it up. And so um, I recommended to them that they pursue the DWATS idea where they could pick a neighborhood, they could tear up a street, they could put the sewage treatment under the street with manholes and then uh, feed that uh, secondary wa treated water uh, from that, uh, that DWATS into a constructed uh, wetland that would be, let's say in a little park-like area in the neighborhood and uh, then um, they would begin to get benefit as they finished each one of these. Now, it's quite possible that if these, uh, if you made the scale of these DWATs slightly larger, you could arrange to capture methane uh, from the DWATs because it, it through, through one or more stages of that treatment process, it, <coughs> it's gonna generate methane. And so use that and uh, uh, attach it to a, uh, uh, a, a microturbine, which would then feed electricity into uh, the, um, the electric grid. Now, a number of landfills in the United States, this is basically where people have just buried, cities have buried garbage and then pushed dirt up over the top of them to cover them up. And so we have mountains on Staten Island in New York, mountains that are a couple of hundred feet high that are landfills. And underneath, you know, about 10 feet of dirt is garbage. Well, what they've been doing is they've been drilling uh, 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 pipe taps down into the landfill and harvesting the methane that comes out of the, man, the, the, the landfill and use that to fire microturbines to make electricity. So I think if you Google that, you'll find lots of information about uh, uh, cogeneration from landfill methane. Uh, you'll find lots of information about uh, cogeneration using methane from sewage treatment plants. So it's a technology that's being pursued in the United States for sure, and I'm sure elsewhere in the world. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks. So this methane actually can, it's it's biogas. So we are probably this can be used as biogas for many other purposes. So yeah, that's right. So I think, thank you. I think that's, thank you for that answer. Uh, yeah, I'm taking the last question. In this high TDS to flushing, can we use the water directly after osmosis treatment or it's necessary to add both AC condensation and storm water to use it, Mr. Monji. So, I mean, you have to go through and do the arithmetic for yourself in terms of how much water is available for each, each um, application. And one thing to look at, remember that, uh, and to some extent this depends upon the, um, the total dissolved solids of your city water. If your water is relatively soft, that you know has on the order of 50 parts per million total dissolved solids, then uh, you can you you can take a lot of uh, additional um, uh, dissolved solids uh, into the water um, and then use it for flushing. On the other hand, if you have a relatively um, high total dissolved solids in your city water, uh, it 
may not be feasible to use 100% treated sewage effluent for flushing because your treated fluids because your treated sewage effluent may have a, a level of total dissolved solids that's too high uh, for use in flushing, resulting in some scale formation and some possible corrosion in your metallic components of your plumbing fixture. So that's a that's a calculation that you would have to do yourself to look at that. <clears throat> Ah, okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Nal, for delivering a lovely presentation on water conservation. Uh, it was attended by uh, around 2,000 participants. Thanks to all the participants for patient learning. Uh, thanks to Mr. Osama for providing the online platform. And last but not the least, I would like to thank to the president of Asher Rajasthan chapter, Mr. Vishab Kasliwal, and uh, the president of Asher India chapter. Dr. Varun Jain for providing all this support. Thank you all. Thank you very much for hosting this. I really, I really enjoyed presenting it. Thank you. You're welcome.